It's easy to feel overwhelmed by the scale of the climate crisis, like you're just one in 7.8 billion people, unclear on what you can do as an individual beyond token actions. In this workshop, Clover Hogan, 21 years old climate activist and founder of Force of Nature, will help you find your power at the junction of passion and the problem you want to solve. Hello, can you guys hear me okay? Amazing. Uh, well, thank you everyone so much for joining today. I've had the absolute privilege of um, tuning in each morning uh, this week to facilitate an anxiety to agency session where we really unpack um, some of our feelings and emotions mm -hmm. around climate change. And so I'm very much looking forward today uh, to seeing those of you um, who are in some of those sessions, but also taking it a step further to really think about how we show up um, in the world of activism uh, and how we really turn a lot of those feelings um, into tangible action. Um, so for background and for those of you who I haven't yet had the privilege of meeting, uh, my name is Clover Hogan. Thank you for the beautiful introduction. Um, I am a 21 year old climate activist. I research the psychology of agents so understanding um, why we do or don't take action on the issues that we really care about deeply. Um, and I'm the founder and executive director of Force of Nature. We are a launch pad to help young people around the world really step up rather than shut down in the face of climate change. And the issue um, that we really exist to take on is that of powerlessness. Um, so we're here to support young people to really shift from a place of feeling hugely overwhelmed and threatened by the issue of climate change, um, by ecological breakdown, and actually get to a point where we have a really clear sense of agency and here's what I can do um, to take on these issues. And I'm hoping that by this point in the summit, um, you're all already feeling a little bit more hopeful now that you've had the chance to connect with lots of other young change makers um, and also uh, learn deeply about all of these problems, not just through the context of the problem, but which solutions already exist and uh, the individuals who are already driving them forward. Um, so today, um, we're going to be looking at um, a kind of model that Force of Nature has developed to really shift from that powerlessness to feeling super empowered. How we're going to do that is by looking um, at the junction of the problem that you want to solve and your passion for solving it. So we believe that when you actually bring these two things together, so when you have the clarity mm -hmm. of an issue that you want to take on and you have a clarity of the skills and talents and passions that you really bring to solving that problem, that at the kind of junction of that sort of Venn diagram is where you really find your power. Um, that's where you really find your impact. So today, um, what we're going to start off with is a quick crash course in the climate change as a system level problem. Um, and then we're going to look at uh, the kind of ecosystem of solutions. We're going to support you to get clear on your own problem within that bigger picture. And then we'll have a conversation of how you can show up to solve it. So um, to kick off, you know, climate change is often spoken as the problem. And yet I think as you realize, especially in the context of having participated in the Youth Climate Summit, climate change really is the symptom of broken systems, you know, from the clothes that I wear to the food in my fridge or how I get around London. And that's one of the reasons why climate change can feel so crippling and paralyzing as an individual, because you know that while your decisions don't equate the business leader um, or the politician, you know, you, each and every one of us has an impact, right? We are contributing to climate change. And yet the flip side of all of that is that, you know, while we have royally messed up the planet in many ways, there are just as many ways to help it. 
And so climate change, while as a generation, it might be the greatest threat we've ever faced, it's also the biggest opportunity to rethink so much of how we live and breathe and exist in the 21st century. And whenever I encounter climate deniers, which does happen on occasion, my instant kind of rebuttal, I suppose, is that you know, all of the solutions that present themselves for climate change are just good things to do anyway. Um, so they're positive solutions that make the more fair kind of equitable societies. And so if we take a, a look now at those solutions, you've already probably encountered a number of them um, over the course of the week, but I would like to introduce you to an amazing resource called Project Drawdown, which is the most comprehensive plan ever proposed to reverse global warming. Um, what's super interesting and what I found fascinating and um, the first time I read it is that the solutions sure include things like solar panels and renewable energy which we've all kind of you know heard about but in that top five list of solutions is reducing food waste um transitioning to more plant rich diets um protecting you know tropical ecosystems and most powerfully educating girls combined with um women's reproductive rights and so we see here a couple of things you know climate justice is about social justice. We won't be able to deliver fair and equitable societies if we don't look after our um, natural resources, our environments, and vice versa. If we don't look after um, people, we'll never be able to protect those local environments anyway. And so even if climate change weren't happening, these solutions are just incredible ways to make for better um, societies and make for a much better, more just world. The other thing that these, uh, the diversity of solutions really shows is just how interconnected they all are. So for example, one of the top solutions is moving toward more plant-based diets. Um, and of course, the leading um, cause of tropical deforestation, which is another area, um, a solution area, is animal agriculture. And so if we're eating less meat and we're wasting less of the food that we're eating, which is currently about 40% of all food in America, a third of food worldwide, um, then we're actually going to have a better chance of also protecting those tropical forests, which relates to the people who look after them. So we see that it's this huge kind of ecosystem interlinking and that really your power as an individual is not necessarily through kind of individual token actions, but taking individual initiative. And what that looks like is actually taking ownership of a problem. So rather than saying, you know, I want to take ownership of all of climate change, which we see is so complex and so multifaceted, it's really how do I take ownership of a single piece of that puzzle? And so the first activity that we're going to do today is to get a little bit more focus on what that problem looks like for you. So I'm going to take um, about a minute or so for us to like just reflect on this. I'm going to ask you a question. And when I ask you this question, I really want you to kind of like connect to your gut, connect to your belly and think about the thing that creates an emotional response for you. So... My first question is, if you could solve any one problem in the world today, what would it be? What's the problem that ignites that fire in your belly that you could talk to a friend about for hours that makes you feel a real sense of injustice and makes you question why? Why is something done this way? Why does this problem exist? I want you to hone in now will take about 10 seconds to find the focus of that problem. And please feel free to share it with the people you're with when you've located it or share it in the chat. Think about that one problem. Okay, I'm hoping you've all had a chance to hone in on that problem, your problem. Now, what I want us to do is a quick visualization. And I'll explain why we're gonna do this visualization in a moment. 
But I want you to take a deep breath in. Deep breath out. And I want you to go ahead and close your eyes. And with your eyes closed, I want you to bring your problem front and center. I want you to visualize your problem. Bring in as much detail and color. Really see it vividly before your eyes. And now as your imagination carries you, I want you to zoom ahead into the future. And I want you to imagine a world where your problem has been solved. This could be 10 years from now, could be 50, maybe it's beyond your own lifetime, but I want you to imagine a world where this problem no longer exists. And sitting securely in that future, I want you now to dial into your community. And I want you to see your community before your own eyes. What does your problem look like now that it has been solved in your community? What does it look like for this problem to no longer exist? And as you see your community, who benefits from this problem being solved? Zoom out a little bit further now. And I want you to see your country in the future. What does your country look like now that this problem no longer exists? In fact, imagine that your country did perhaps what seemed like the impossible thing but actually stepped up as one of the first global leaders to take ownership of this problem and to deliver a solution. What had to change? Who had to step up? And as you sit securely in this better, brighter future, I want you to think about what we do differently. What did we have to leave behind and invite into the present to make this future a reality? Now, I want you to see someone very important in this future. I want you to see yourself. I want you to envision yourself in this picture and consider what you had to do the bridge between where we stand today and where we must be tomorrow. Consider for a second what that first step 
looked like. And then the next step. And the step after that. How did you need to channel your emotions around this issue and the care that you had for solving it into stepping up and taking action, deciding to step up rather than shut down in the face of this problem? You can open your eyes now. And we're going to take a minute, either in reflection, written reflection of articulating what your vision looked like or sharing with the people around you. What came up in that visualization? What maybe surprised you? And how did it feel to see that alternative future? We'll take a minute. Okay, so we're going to keep forging ahead now and we're going to do another reflection um, before we move to the skills and talents and passions that we have to show up and actually solve our problem and show up with our why. Um, so what I'm going to do is share my screen now. One second. Okay. And we're going to reflect on our why here. So now that you've had a chance to begin to identify that problem, and thank you for sharing, I see someone um, chose racial injustice. So as you look at your problem, and as you've had a chance to really get under the skin of the future and think about what a world looks like once this problem has been solved, I want us to take a chance to kind of bridge between the two, to think about our why. This is really important because while our problem, the thing we show up to solve every day might change and morph, um, our why stays pretty consistent. We can also think of it as our kind of catalyst moment. So the thing that compelled us to take action or the thing that compelled us to care in the first instance, you know, that thing within you that compelled you to be here today or to join this Youth Climate Summit. And so I want you to think now, we're gonna take another couple of minutes for reflection on this, but I want you to ask yourselves some uh, probing questions. So why is it that you care so deeply about this problem? Why does it trigger something within you? Why do you want this vision that you brought to life just a couple of minutes ago? Think, is it someone who inspires you to show up? A place you can't imagine living without? Something that happened that you never want to happen to anyone else? Whatever that why is for you, I'd love us to take a couple of minutes now to reflect. And something I find really helpful to kind of continue peeling back those layers is to continue to ask why. That sounds quite obvious, but if you come up with a reason, I want you to ask why again. You know, why is it that, you know, that thing triggered something within me? And then when you get to that why, asking another why again so that you continue distilling down until you get to that 
core of the why and the core of why it is that you care about this issue and identifying and recognizing what that why is for you is in many ways at the heart of your activism and at the heart of your ability to actually show up. And so I want us to take two minutes now in reflection, either written or just quiet contemplation, and then we will regroup. Okay, so now we're going to be moving on to um, another fun exercise. Um, since we've had a chance to really locate our problem, we've had a chance to begin to bring the future of a solution to life by way of our imaginations, by way of envisioning, and we've begun to bridge between the two by way of our why. So why it is that we're actually catalyzed to act and why it is that we want to sustain this action. I want us um, in the final segment of this session to get clear on what tools we have in our arsenal, in our back pocket, um, to be able to actually show up and take action. This is really important because it's often quite easy to feel like almost a faceless activist. Um, like you're, you know, showing up and taking action on the problem, you're out in the street protesting, or you're part of a project, part of an initiative, yet it's very easy to kind of leave yourself behind in that process. And in fact, any change maker in history would say that to have impact, you must have focus and focus in two domains. So in the problem that you want to show up and solve, and of course, in where you're uniquely placed to solve it, um, we're each gifted with a bunch of skills and talents and passions to take action and show up every day. And yet often we don't really have a chance to unpack them and think about what it is that, you know, makes us unique. And unfortunately, you know, many of us go through an education system where often we feel like we don't really have that opportunity either. Um, you know, there's a lot of rote learning involved in education and it's quite easy to feel like a set of averages, like spreading yourself thin across lots of different areas. And yet by playing to our strengths, um, we can really have impact and we can really um, make our activism our own. So with that, I'm going to go through each of these types of intelligence and as um, I do so, I'd love it if we could, um, or if you could uh, score yourself on each one out of 10. 
So if you want to write down, you can do it mentally um, to think, you know, one being I'm really rubbish at that, 10 being yes, that's exactly where I'm in my flow. Um, for me, mathematical is right down <laughs> toward the one end of the spectrum, really not a logical or mathematical thinker. Um, and so that's definitely not my strength. Whereas um, intrapersonal for me is my highest type of intelligence, kind of checking in with myself and understanding why I do what I do, which is where so much of my passion for psychology really comes from, you know, understanding the mind and understanding how our mind affects our ability to take action. So without further ado, I'm going to go through each one. And as I do so, um, give you a quick introduction to um, a change maker I know um, who's very strong in this type of intelligence. So the first one is musical intelligence. And again, just give yourself a score out of 10 for each one. So musical intelligence refers to your ability to discern sounds, rhythms and tones in music. Um, this is my friend here, Shutesca Martinez, um, founder and executive director of Earth Gardens and also a really incredible musician. Um, he released a track not too long ago with Jaden Smith and all of his music is around climate action, um, his journey and path as an indigenous rights activist, um, the environment, our relationship to nature. He's found an incredible vehicle um, for telling his message through sound with this really innate gift that he has. Um, you don't necessarily need to be a musician to ha have high musical intelligence. It could be that you love theater. Um, it could be, you know, that you're a great orator. You love the sound element of actually, you know, speaking. Um, it could be that, you know, you are always making sounds and rhythms on your desk. You know, think of, of the broad spectrum of how this might show up and think about whether that relates to you personally. Verbal linguistic intelligence. Uh, so this is the ability to master language to communicate. Um, we can think about this in the context of, you know, storytelling, writing, uh, you know, if you love writing a good essay or article, um, or if you really love speaking, you love the nature of words, you love playing with words. Um, an example here would be Helena, who is an Indigenous rights activist and storyteller. Uh, to me, she's a really wonderful person interesting case of this because she's able to invite people to the conversation through her gift of storytelling her ability to um kind of cut through the science to tell really compelling stories that invite people in and invite people to engage with the issues in a really different way the third is logical mathematical my great weakness um and this is related to the ability to solve mathematical reasoning problems um so an example here boy and slat is the CEO of the Ocean Cleanup. Um, he is very scientifically minded, very logically minded, um, and he has done an incredible thing, which is start an amazing company um, that is actually cleaning up much of the plastic trash in the ocean. Um, I highly recommend that you check him out. And he clearly has a very logical way of computing and solving problems, um, rather than being as much a kind of idealist or nebulous thinker he's very pragmatic in okay here's a problem here's how i can apply myself to solving it through science then we have visual and spatial intelligence so this is the ability to look at the world and surroundings from different perspectives um ashwarya is a wildlife photographer so she has a really clear kind of eye for capturing nature um but of course you know this relates to um artistic intelligence um if you're you know really good drawer or painter or you simply have a good kind of aesthetic eye you can see how um visual elements kind of play to one another if you're quite passionate about fashion chances are you're also strong in visual and spatial intelligence or of course with the spatial element um, maybe you're quite good at reading maps maybe you're really drawn to architecture um, but any of the, that very broad kind of diverse range suggests that you would have strong visual and spatial intelligence then we have bodily kinesthetic intelligence. So this includes bodily and motor skills. The obvious ones are if you're a great dancer, again, you know, musical theater, something you use your body a lot. Um, if you're a really good sports person, um, the example I've included here is Beetleums, who is a tech innovator and often references kind of using her hands and fidgeting a lot to 
um, bring things together. And chances are, if you're really strong in this intelligence, it means that you learn by doing. Um, so you really learn by um, actually building things, kind of sticking your hands in the mud. If you love gardening, chances are you also have high bodily kinesthetic intelligence because it's all about that relationship to um, the physical. Intrapersonal intelligence, so this is my highest one, um, and this refers again to having that deep understanding of oneself. Um, for me, this is really about understanding, you know, why you react in certain ways, understanding your own mental and emotional landscape. If you're passionate about psychology in the way I am, Chad, so you have a pretty high intrapersonal intelligence. You really want to understand not just how you work, but how other people work inside um, and understanding motivations, expectations, beliefs, all of that good stuff. Then we have interpersonal intelligence, and this really relates to the ability to relate to others, connect with others, and socialize. Um, chances are, if you have high interpersonal intelligence, you might have been told off quite a bit in school for being a chatterbox, um, because this is really about how you connect to other people um, and how you socialize and um, how you relate, how you understand you know, where other people are coming from and, and how you build bridges. Um, the example I have here is my friend Malati, who I went to the green school with, um, who's the founder of Bye Bye Plastic Bags and also Utopia. Um, she and her sister at the ages of 10 and 12 decided to take on plastic pollution in Bali. And as a direct result of their lobbying several years on, Bali is the first island in Indonesia to ban disposable plastics, which is pretty damn cool. Um, so these girls, um, you know, I think what really distinguished them and what made them successful was their ability to play to this particular strength of the interpersonal and really be community builders. You know, everything that they did from day one was how to build community around them, how to build community for the cause. Um, and, you know, they're natural kind of socialized. They're very good at inviting lots of different people to the table. Finally, we have naturalistic intelligence. So this is the ability to detect, differentiate and categorize aspects of one's environment. So if the natural world and understanding how it works, understanding the complexity of ecosystems um, is really something that comes naturally to you, chances are you're quite high in this intelligence. Um, you know, this also applies not just to, you know, flora and fauna and wanting to understand animals and how they think and feel and how they relate to their broader environment, but of course, like geology as well. You know, if you're really fascinated by rocks, if you're really fascinated by earth science, um, you know, I love understanding where we come from you know millions of years of history of how the earth has been shaped how the climate works you know this is all naturalistic intelligence um and a more literal example is uh you know the first time i went to borneo um in indonesia i you know was trekking with a couple of guides who had grown up um, on the land and they were able to point, you know, 100 meters away and say, oh, see how that branch was broken there. That's because an orangutan was just here. And it's that ability to just absorb and soak in that natural world and really connect, feel at one with it. Naturalistic intelligence is something innate to each and every one of us. But of course, it's something that um, many of us living in urbanized environments don't really have the chance to play to. Elizabeth is another dear friend who is the founder of the Green Generation Initiative in Kenya. Um, she has mobilized tens of thousands of young Kenyans in reforestation projects to actually plant trees and connect to the natural world and know what it is that they're fighting for. So that's been our kind of whistle stop tour through the different types of intelligence. And I hope in doing so, you've each had a chance to really um, get clear um, on, you know, where you're uniquely placed. I mean, that's the reality. Intelligence itself is quite an arbitrary construct. And, you know, this idea of IQ that we have, and often the idea of the intelligence that is fostered and promoted in school is quite a narrow view at the diversity of skills and talents that each and every one of us carries. And so I really encourage you to continue this exploration forward as you look at how you uniquely show up to solve these problems and how you can apply that wealth of experience and that wealth of gifts um, to actually take action.
So by way of next steps, um, get clear out of that evaluation of which intelligence you're strongest in. And I encourage you to continue to map and explore at the junction of that problem that you identified and your intelligence. You know, what would it look like for you to take action um, on that problem through the guise, through the lens of where you're uniquely placed to do so? By finding that focus, once again, that is where you're going to have impact and that is where you're going to find your power. You know, be able to shift from that place of feeling powerless and overwhelmed and anxious toward the issues to here's what I actually can do and what I can start doing today. So that draws a conclusion to our session. Everyone's an activist. Um, really encourage you to reach out, stay connected. Again, um, you can reach me at Clover Hogan on Instagram, Twitter, all of the platforms, um, and Force of Nature at forceofnature.xyz on all of the same. Um, we run anxiety to agency classrooms uh, free to all students around the world every single week. So I encourage you to join us over there. And otherwise, please just do um, see us as a resource and a support as well, should you ever have any questions um, or inquiries or want to get involved. But thank you all so much. And um, I will see you at the end of the summit.